Yo, Arthur. Hey, what's up, man? How's it going? Good, good. Just finishing up the marathon of calls. Yeah. Typical you have a lot of Sunday. To do today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I basically took 30 minutes to relax, and uh, that was very beneficial. Nice. What kind of calls do you have today? Oh, I actually had a, an amazing call with Rockefeller's uh, researchers. Um, and we doubled down on the actual like use cases and things and types of papers and lots of stuff, which kind of like reduces all of the things to a very specific uh, scope of work, which is exciting. Cool. Is that recorded? Yep. I have Anson annotating it and I'll share that once, once that's done. Sweet. It's very awesome. cool. Okay, so uh, the, the thing that I wanted to sync on is basically the next iteration of this mega diagram that I'm trying to compile, which is um, an attempt, uh, well, to describe everything at once, which is very counterproductive in a way, but at least <laughs> it, it helps me navigate everything because, uh, you know, Every time I share this diagram with everyone, everyone's like, what's going on? I have no idea what's going on. But I, since then, like since a couple of days ago, I realized that the real benefit comes to like just, you know, me understanding things and then being able to jump into specific parts and be able to, uh, you know, throw uh, some value uh, within specific scope. So I took a look at your diagram it's uh it's amazing in terms of how descriptive it is in, in like different uh relationships and kind of flows i i really need to catch up how to do that for for this diagram if that's even possible um but basically the thing that i've upgraded my diagram to now includes uh vt as a scope and I want to kind of get more of your input because I barely understand. I, I'm probably like submission one in terms of like the, the scope, just because there was a bunch of stuff that happened when I was away. And then I came back and there's this giant diagram and I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we kind of uh, <coughs> increased our scope by sixfold uh, once round one finished. Which is am amazing. So let me uh, share my screen real quick. And I assume I've shared this diagram with you before or you've seen it somewhere. Yeah, I've seen it floating around the search engine channel. Um, I haven't looked at it very carefully, but I've seen this. Okay, so uh, probably a good intro will be helpful, which is, um, you know, a lot of stuff that we do can be separated in four things. And by separated, I'm very cautious by using that word. Like it's all interconnected, but in a way it can be separated uh, at some point of time. So there is data infrastructure, obviously data sets, DevOps, the cloud, the curation stuff, everything that goes and deals with data. Then there is ontology engines, which is kind of a weird thing that no one can explain what it does and what it is, but we'll, we'll get to it uh, in a bit. Then there is AI powered literature review tools, which is essentially tables and essentially the outputs uh, from Cord19 that, uh, that are, are useful or like useful enough for researchers to do something with. And then there is Discovery Engine, this kind of magical thing that we see as a grand vision, something that is um, basically a way to navigate the data and reduce uncertainty about it and be able to um, help researchers reduce uncertainty to maximize the knowledge uh, derivation process, like the ability to derive knowledge from unstructured data. And that itself has like some interface, search engine, inference engine, and tracing engine. And again, it's a lot of complexity that I'm failing to communicate, but it's kind of irrelevant at, at this point. Basically, search engine allows you to filter stuff, 
inference engine allows you to uh, derive uh, certain knowledge or like helps you um, further filter it with some additional new data and tracing engine is going to be crucial to our ability to actually explain how this amazing tool um, you know led to certain uh, results because imagine like in three months we were going to create something so good and so cool that researchers will open up the tool type in something and then boom they they basically understand that there is some drug that is underutilized and can be helpful in in solving the pandemic right and they cannot go to like white house and tell them hey guys like i really believe that this drug will help and i have no idea why like mm -hmm. this amazing tool on the internet told me that and yeah. that's kind of like the current limitation of the ai and machine learning uh, you know the explainability of ai is a is a very big pro problem that DARPA's and deep minds of the world are, are trying to solve. I don't believe we'll be able to solve it within Corona Y, but at least we, we can create a framework for someone to, to help, uh, you know, solve. It. But that's okay. kind of the, the intro. Does it make sense so far? <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like search is like information retrieval, inference is like knowledge discovery, and tracing is just like interpretability of that knowledge. So that all makes total sense to me. Cool. Perfect. Um, oh, one question, actually. Can you talk a little bit more? I don't know. Maybe it's not meaningful, but can you talk more about the difference between discovery engine versus like AI powered review tool? So the AI review tool is like, here's a, <laughs> here's a report and the discovery engine is maybe more like uh, you enable the user to query stuff and like, uh, yeah, so, something like that. So uh, literature review is basically tables, right? Okay. And like, this is kind of the output of the literature review tool because it's, it's just a bunch of tables. You can navigate it and search by certain things like uh, cardio stuff, you open and search for it. For example, if you're a researcher that um, it wants to learn more or like uh, double down on heart disease risk factors, you're gonna search for heart disease risk factors then you also have to understand what kind of ontologies exist, what kind of relationships exist, how things are named differently, like cardio, cerebrovascular disease. And if you know about that, you can definitely find it. So it's kind of like the Google analogy. If you know what to look for, you will find it. You just need to type in the right keyword. With a Discovery Engine, it's like, you know, um, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, heart uh, related, uh, I don't know, comorbidities or something exist or something, some querying. It may not even be a, a, a question. It can be just a bunch of keywords. And then you see some things that pop up that are representative of the things that exist real, in relation to this query. You know, does it make sense? So it kind of sounds like they're two slightly different use cases slash, I guess, uh, user kind of workflows sort of thing. Yeah, primarily based off the notion of, you know, AI powered literature review tools are used when you know what to look for and you just need to find that data mm -hmm. to derive knowledge by, by yourself. So there is potentially unlimited um, uncertainty, right? Like the scope is very large and it's up to you as a human uh, observer to reduce that uncertainty through the prism of your mental construct. Yeah. And for right. Discovery Engine, we're actually reducing that uncertainty for you. Um, you know, still like it's not 100% certain, but it's, it's reduced enough for you to understand what exists. Yeah. Cool, that makes sense. I think the just my general <coughs> word of caution or suggestion is that whenever we're saying like discovery engine, just um, we should make everything that we're doing as transparent as possible to the researchers. So that's like where the interpretability fits in and that's where just like maybe stating our procedures for how we're retrieving information up front because for researchers, we really wanna know like what's not being on the, left on the table and like, you know, how are we getting to these results? And so for people to actually use it, they just need to trust it and that that just comes from probably like interpretability and, and transparency as much as possible. 
Yeah, 100% agree. Okay, so let's go deep into ontology engines. And that's yeah. not one thing, but actually many, many different things that are defined by multiple layers. And so far, I kind of separated it into the metadata layer, basically things that exist for, um, for papers or things related to the papers that are not, that are, um, not unique per direction of research. So it's like the geodata is the same both to risk factors and the vaccines and therapeutics uh, task. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'd like to see like temporal data too. So they offer like publication time, but it's of different qualities. Like some, some people just put uh, 2020, but really they should put like the actual date. And so there is some cleaning that has to be done there. And that's like a general, another one of those general metadata features that we would need. Perfect. And I'm sure you, you have more uh, of that. And I just need to, to extract that from individual teams. But you get the idea. There is some yep. metadata. Um, then there is the direction layer, which is actually what we call like uh, what we've created for those four teams uh, at the very beginning. Uh, actually, three teams because the geo task was really the metadata layer team because it was applied to all three teams. The direction layer is really defined by direction of research or a question. So we kind of when we jumped into Kaggle we took those as, you know, as granted, like, hey, there are 10 uh, directions of research and just um, let's use those. And we picked uh, three of them to pursue. And as a result, we have uh, these three teams, for example, yours, vaccine and therapeutics, which um, has some ontology, some structure underneath. And this is where I, I need your help to fill out everything that exists so far. But um, to give you an example, basically what I'm aware is there are types of treatments, there are types of drugs, there are types of vaccines, there are types of things, right? And each of the th these things actually produce uh, different types of data and different uh, you know, ways of how this data is represented. So here comes the data layer, which is like dosage ranges or genes or things like that. Then, um, like I, I kind of connected this other team that doesn't exist yet, um, which is the clinical trials team. I can only assume that you have it in your scope of work or something, and that's why I connected it, and we'll have to correct it if that's wrong. But basically, there are types of trials that produce um, types of specimen, types of animals, and things like that. So my question is, does this make sense in general? Uh, I think at the high level, yeah, you, you're just kind of saying like what sorts of things are on our radar and like what sorts of, um, yeah, I guess kinds of ontologies of things we're like dealing <coughs> with, mm -hmm. specifically within our team. Yep, and to give you more examples, there is a risk factors team and the thing that they deal is types of risks, health conditions, and demographics. And there is some more that I haven't filled out yet. And mm -hmm. then for transmissions and incubation team, there is types of environment, incubation ranges, and something else to fill out. Gotcha. So I, I would like to, you know, uh, and again, I understand if this is too abstract or too general, but if basically there, there are two points of feedback that I'm looking for, um, whether this list of like types is complete and then whether this types of data things is complete. And I'm almost certain it's not. Yeah. Um, okay. So I can, what's, what's the best way to do this? Should I just like, say things should i give yeah just you... just say it if if you have it on on top of your mind sure so let me look at our diagram and i can tell you like um things that might fit into this schematic as you're kind of imagining it i think especially relevant are so i'm looking at my big system diagram thing especially relevant are going to be the input uh input data that i have listed so the little uh little files icon 
So things that we're interested in are drugs. So we have like a lexicon of drugs, um, which is just like, you know, the vocabulary of drugs that we're thinking about, trying to uh, know things about. And that's now, like which team is, is this? So just generally, drugs are pretty ubiquitous in almost all of these projects because five of these projects are on the drug side of things and not vaccines. Mm, okay. Um, so really for the left track, for the uh, drug, uh, for the adjuvant therapy stuff, that'll be useful for the adverse drug reactions and drug dosage, and then like contradictory claim stuff. Uh, claims, right? Yeah, contradictory claim stuff is like the right path. Okay, so claims and um, well, that's that's not really not exactly type. types of claims it's because data, right? Kind yeah, of. so so I wouldn't necessarily put claims there because because for that project, uh, we're just interested in like seeing where the literature will disagree with itself about certain claims generally from papers. So like one paper might say, uh, this is the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine. And this other paper says like, oh no, we're not seeing any clinical utility from hydroxychloroquine, that kind of sentiment. So I don't, I don't know how clean oh, that fits. Okay, into so I, I got it. That's not really representative of data or types. That's really a byproduct of comparing uh, comparing like effect what is the data that you're comparing when you're uh, trying to produce the comparison of claims so yeah we're still thinking about this because we have to think about like which specific questions are being compared but let's say in an ideal world that we can distill down like one of the central hypotheses or central claims of the paper and then we can match that against the central claim of another paper and then just see that comparison and see how they fit together. That's the kind of thing that we're trying to do. So you can extract that kind of sentiment maybe from like the conclusion paragraph, for example, of one paper against the conclusion of the other, or even looking at the titles of the papers and seeing how those compare. But what um, is the process that the conclusion is about? The conclusion will say like, okay, so we've done this whole study and we've shown that like, for for example, like uh, mortality is really high using hydroxychloroquine. It's almost becoming like a risk factors type of question. Okay. And basically, there are there is mortality as the key, um, like, and and result. Yeah. So, right? Yeah. So we haven't fully specified this list of like and and things that are being compared. But for example, like mortality would be one, or like maybe effect size, maybe like the notion of some adverse events being Adverse extracted. effects. Yeah. Okay. Like that. I've heard the, that one before from Hillary, I think. Yeah. So okay. that's, we're interested in that in a separate project also, like for all the drugs that are mentioned in the literature, like are there certain adverse drug reactions that are mentioned in conjunction with them? So like you take chloroquine, this paper says that like the, the patients who are taking chloroquine experience bleeding. And we just want to get like a similar kind of dashboard as round one, but just like, I want to click on this drug and I want to see what kinds nice. of adverse drug reactions people had. That's awesome. Okay. So that's that's uh, one of the tasks. Uh, and then, so for that, there's like, to go into like data specification stuff, um, we're using like a specific lexicon of like adverse drug reactions. So, you know, there's in the, community there exists these lists um one is known as medra and that might be the one that we'll use and so yeah like if you look uh under this kind of middle path like the fourth lane there's like the adverse drug reaction lexicon so that's like an input uh vocabulary that we're using there for that adr yeah oh yeah. okay that little thing yeah nice okay so Okay, let me let me ask you a question. Yeah, are please. you prim primarily working with the subset of COVID nineteen that is clinical trials data? Um, it depends on the task, and that's also specified in the little schematic. But for example, with the adverse drug reactions, 
Yeah, yeah. See, like up in the path, we're mm. getting the clinical literature first because we're only interested in like. I mean, it only kind of makes sense like adverse drug reactions that humans are experiencing in the clinic, right? So yeah, we need to retrieve that subset of the literature first. But for example, for like Jeremy's project, that we're interested more in like experimental papers because you're interested in knowing like this protein interacts with this protein or this drug inhibits this receptor and you're interested in that kind of thing, you're not going to get that from clinical trials. You're going to get that more from like people doing these wet lab experiments and like, you know, testing things out. So let me ask you by experimental literature, which ones does it fit from this list? It fits. So I would say, uh, the the classification that Christine and I have been using, I think, is is a good one. So I'd recommend going off of that. But in this list, it would be molecular studies, but I would exclude probably in silico. So I'm just thinking in vitro studies. So people like you know working with cells and <coughs> like cell screens mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff, or in vivo like uh, mouse models and things like that. But in silico, like like some computational person making a prediction about like this kind of binding thing, I think I would, I think Jeremy is maybe not interested in that. Okay. And by the classification that you are using with Christ, Christine, you're mm -hmm. using this one, right? Um, time different analysis. Is this, this, is this looks like David's. So there's this uh, guy, David, I forgot his last name, who also did kind of the same task as us and posted his Kaggle. annotations on Kaggle. Yeah, Mooney or something. Like that. Yeah. yeah, so we, we've been we've been kind of cross-referencing against those categories and ours are like pretty similar. It's it's pretty clear that he was only interested in clinical literature. So for mm -hmm. example, in his categorization, I don't see any experimental stuff. So if you look yeah. at these nine or 10 categories, there's like modeling, which is the computational stuff, but not the like in vitro and vivo stuff. Can you send me the list of uh, types that you're using for, for your team? after? Yeah, I can. Or if you can send it now. Um, I need to retrieve it, so it might take a second. Okay. Uh, let me send that after the call, actually. Okay, sounds Unless, good. Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, so I could, yeah, do you want me to, there's probably things that I can keep going with as far as populating that box of VT if you want, or? Let's do it as what? much as we can in terms of like fast population, and then I'll, I'll send this uh, um, thing to you and we can populate it asynchronously too whenever you have time. Yeah, I can also, yeah, yeah, exactly. I can add stuff myself if that's helpful. Um, so, so I'm thinking of right now just lexicons. Um, and so, for example, again, the drug lexicon, adverse drug reactions. What do you mean by uh, drug lexicon? I, I don't get it. I just mean like a vocabulary of all the drugs that we're interested in. Okay. So the, oh, not like drugs, but the actual names of, of drugs. Yeah, I just want a list of the drugs that I'm going to look for in the papers. Okay. Uh, okay, makes sense. Because I wouldn't, yeah, so like it, in that case, I wouldn't call that like a full-fledged ontology because it's not like, it, it's more just a vocabulary list, but yep. an ontology would have things like, oh, this drug and lots of specifications about how it relates to other drugs mm -hmm. and like a taxonomy of like what those drugs mean and all these other features. I'm just interested in a lot of different like vocabularies at this stage. Makes sense. Okay. So yeah, there's a drug lexicon, adverse drug reactions lexicon. Um, it's, it's to be seen how Jeremy wants to go about with his project. He, he's a little bit autonomous right now. And so I had some initial ideas, but you might even want to expand that beyond what I was originally thinking. Yeah. Well, but so there, go ahead. So there's going to be like for his project, there's going to be like uh, I guess a, a lexicon of proteins uh, mm -hmm. and that kind of comes yeah. for free once you just do like spacey named entity recognition. But yeah, there's, there's proteins that we're interested in, genes, um, tissues and like cell types. And uh, Slava at one point asked 
me and Jeremy like, oh, what kind of ontologies do you want it to be ingested by the system? And we gave him a list of all these things. Like there's like a cell line ontology. Uh, um, there's like, yeah, gene ontologies. And so all these things, Slava is aware that like, they should like be ingested into the system. And are you also using, uh, what was it? Um, phases and types of, uh, no, no phases and there was something oh cell lines yeah so it's here for yeah so for just jeremy's project specifically we're interested in like the experimental stuff so and uh so that means you actually need to filter out things by phases um the phases are part of clinical literature so because we're only interested in experimental stuff like uh molecular kinds of experiments that notion of like phase, like phase one, phase two, um, I guess that's that applies to clinical trials. Okay. Uh, that's not applicable in this context specifically. Makes sense. Okay. Um, let's see, other lexicons. Those are the main, those are it as far as like kind of just lexicons of different things that we're looking at. But then uh, like another data source will be like Twitter data. So we're interested in seeing kind of related to, and sorry, I'm kind of jumping around to all the different projects we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, kind of related to the project about like contradictory claims. One thing we're interested in is looking at Twitter data to see the sentiment about uh, certain papers related to drugs or vaccines. Oh man, Are you, you know what, I'll send you that uh, video was Rockefeller. I didn't realize, but they, told us that uh, researchers frequently tweet the actual articles uh, and they sometimes use Twitter to discover new papers yeah. and they pointed us into this alt metric uh, yeah. thing and yeah. it's pretty cool. It is, yeah. So it is, it's kind of funny because like academic Twitter quote unquote is very much a thing and you know if, if researchers don't like a paper they'll often go to Twitter and they'll complain about the paper and they'll say oh look at all these flaws with the paper and then other people will also respond and yeah, oh, this was a garbage paper. So it's, it's almost <coughs> like you're crowdsourcing from the experts, like what do you think about the paper? So that's why Twitter is actually a really good source to think about these like meta science, like paper quality things. Whereas looking at, you know, if you look at the paper itself and maybe you can, like a, one thing that you would think or would want to try to do is maybe like assess the quality of the paper directly by looking at the paper, but that's like a very subtle, difficult thing. And maybe you can do proxies like oh if they mention certain biases or like they don't mention randomizing their study or doing all these like proper statistical things maybe i can make assumptions about the paper quality but but that's very tricky and so looking at twitter lets you like you know think about the quality of the paper by just digesting what people are talking about it because they've thought about it they've you know expressed their subjective opinion about the paper uh, so that, that's why i think twitter is a very cool place to this is explore. insane 40,000 tweets about this yeah. paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> great. From a Stanford study. So that's like a really good example. Like it, it's, I couldn't, it would be hard for me to think of like how I would implement some NLP method to like extract the fact that this was like a bad paper and had biases, unless mm -hmm. I have some very intricate rules about like statistical biases and all that. But if I just look at Twitter, you see everyone's complaining about the paper. And so like, that's a pretty good signal. And yeah. there's probably something there. And then maybe you can topic model and summarize what people are saying. And you can do stuff like that. Oh, man, this is an exciting project. I almost want to jump in and actually code. <laughs> <laughs> it is cool. Yeah, it's fun. So Ali's leading that project now. and just kind of getting the Twitter, uh, Twitter data. And then we'll start seeing uh, what the sentiment is. Have you actually requested or got the API key for Altmetric? No, I haven't. Okay, I'm going to write them an email. Sure. Because, I mean, they definitely already aggregate all of this stuff. So. Yeah, they might have some interesting stuff there. Even to the point of just giving us access to these 30,000 tweets and things like that. I think we should be able to get the tweets. And I've seen the Twitter release some kind of like open COVID data set. Oh, really? So. There's at least that, that information. Yeah, Christine just posted about it uh, earlier today. I can tag you on that. Nice. Okay. Uh, well, this this is super helpful. It, cool. it definitely helped me fill out the, the missing pieces in the picture. 
Um, I'll send you the uh, the thing and oh, thanks for tagging me. And yeah, just uh, fill as much as you can asynchronously and l let me know w where the things don't connect from, from your perspective. That sounds good, yeah. And let me know as you have other questions, because I mean, probably a lot of things that a lot of us researchers are talking about, we're making assumptions that like, oh yeah, like, you know, clinical studies is this and that, and like maybe it's it's not so obvious for someone who hasn't been like in it's research. Not, so like, so I, please ask lots of questions and don't feel bad about it. Yeah, I'm, again, I, I don't even know what's randomized clinical trial and like, <laughs> and like even to the basics of it so uh that, I, yeah i mean those all those different like design study designs like that's you know that's like yeah. complicated actually yeah. so yeah that's cool all right sounds good man thank you so much for jumping on the call i'll actually post a recording of this call into vt team if you're cool with that uh because i do feel it, it it helps people navigate things or not who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Sounds good, man. Cool. Thanks for chatting.